We're alive, and I'm doing this on my secondary channel, so probably no one will tune in until well after the fact. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. <coughs> We're gonna read Fat Men from Space by yeah. Daniel Pinkwater. It was actually the first, what I considered a chapter book when I first read it in like third grade. There are no chapters, it's one linear story without any breaks, but I was very proud of myself. I don't believe I've read it since. Um, it is dedicated to S. Achillesian, which is the biggest baby ever born specifically in Budapest. I don't know why it's dedicated to that, but it is. Well, they like that baby. Uh, this is Fat Men from Space. It it's does have illustrations. <laughs> so, I will be holding those up periodically if I remember to do so. Kimmy is cute. <laughs> No, Kimmy likes the story. She's listening intently. That's why her ears are up. Well, maybe it's because I'm too loud. Alright. William went to the dentist. And it wasn't so bad, just a filling. The dentist said it wouldn't hurt a bit, and it was almost true. William went home feeling a little bit numb. There was a funny, sour taste in his mouth that made him think of electricity. When he sucked in his breath, the tooth with the new filling felt cold. He was able to eat his supper, though, without any trouble, and after watching television with his mother and father, he went to bed. One of the things Williams liked to do in bed, and wasn't allowed to, was listen to the radio. He is a child. <laughs> William always thought that if he had a little radio with an earphone, he could listen in bed without bothering anybody. He mentioned this to his parents and found out that not bothering anybody wasn't the point. I don't want you listening to the radio when you're supposed to be asleep, his mother said. Sometimes William would turn on the radio on the table near his bed very softly, though, and still try to listen. Usually his mother would hear it and tell him to turn it off. This particular night, after William had been to the dentist... He was lying in bed listening to the radio. He was listening to a talk show. A man who had said he had taken a ride in a flying saucer and was telling people from outer space about how they were crazy about potato pancakes and had come to Earth in search of millions of them, which they planned to freeze and take back to their own galaxy. It was a really good show and William was enjoying it. He was ready to drift <laughs> off to sleep <laughs> when he realized that he had never turned the radio on. He checked this. He clicked on the radio next to his bed, and it was turned to a music station. He could still hear the man talking about the flying saucers over the music. Are you playing the radio? His mother shouted from down the hall. <laughs> William turned off the radio. <laughs> the flying saucer man was still talking. Can you hear the radio now? He asked. No! Don't turn it on again! His mother screamed. I mean, that's suspicious. That just sounds like your son can't yeah. hear it. <laughs> His mother could not hear the man talking about the flying saucers, so where was it coming from? William lay very quietly, trying to figure out where the radio program was coming from, and it seemed to be coming from inside his head. Maybe I'm imagining the whole thing, he thought. Oh, maybe I'm going crazy. And it seemed like an ordinary radio program. There wasn't anything too crazy about it. He, William imagines something. He's never done this before. <laughs> he had heard the same talk show before. The announcer was telling people to buy the same bottled spring water and the same canned hams and pianos that always sponsored the program. So it was a real radio program going on inside William's head, and this worried him. He rubbed the tip of his tongue against his new filling, and the volume dropped very low. Wait a second. He did it again, and the volume dropped. He pressed his tongue against the tooth. No radio program at all. It was the tooth. The one with the new filling was receiving radio programs. Imagine the court case you would have. <laughs> well, apparently, this used to be like a, a myth or like a thing. Mm -hmm. That was like for like the... Because I remember hearing about it when I got fillings. Mm -hmm. uh, I told you to turn that off! His mother shouted as the volume got louder. <laughs> William got up. He went quietly out into the backyard. He clenched his teeth. <laughs> the radio got louder. He clenched his teeth harder, and it got louder still. Keeping his teeth clenched, he pulled his lips back into a big grin. It got so loud that it made an echo. He could hear windows opening and people shouting, Turn that thing down! <laughs> and then the captain of the spacecraft asked me if I knew where there were a lot of potato pancakes. The radio tooth yelled. 
<laughs> William jumped up and down. Oh, this was wonderful. He didn't know how it worked, but this was wonderful. He had a built-in radio. William scurried back to bed before anybody could call the cops. <laughs> he had waked up the whole neighborhood. Is that, is that correct? No. Okay. He had, he had waked up the whole neighborhood. <laughs> he was barely able to lie still. He was so excited about his built-in radio, he decided it would be the most fun if he didn't tell anybody about it for a while. Finally, he got tired of planning ways to use his radio tooth and bored listening to the man talking about flying saucers and potato pancakes. And he put his tongue over his tooth and went to sleep. At breakfast, when William put a spoonful of cornflakes into his mouth, the spoon touched the tooth and changed the station. He had been listening to news, but it changed to rock and roll. William took the spoon out, back to news. He put the spoon back in, rock and roll. He tried a fork, news and country and western music at the same time. He put a butter knife in his mouth. <laughs> he put a butter knife into his mouth and it was classical music. William, will you stop? Playing with the silverware. I was just about to say, his parents were watching this. <laughs> his father said, and I think somebody left the radio playing upstairs. William put his tongue over his tooth. It wasn't easy to finish breakfast and keep the radio from playing. At school, William resisted the temptation to use his radio tooth to show off. There were a lot of kids standing around in the schoolyard waiting for the bell to ring. William stayed by himself, chewing on the wire bindings of a notebook. You know, like a crazy person it has got a picture. <laughs> Just like a drooling maniac. <laughs> Depending on where he bit into the wire, he could get different stations. Mr. Wendell was William's teacher. He didn't stand for any nonsense. And because he was hard to fool, the kids tried to trick him even more. But nobody ever succeeded. Kids were always planning to put glue on his chair or substitute fake chalk made of soap. And when these things were tried, Mr. Wendell always spotted the glue or the fake chalk and turned the joke around by asking one of the kids to sit in his chair or write on the blackboards themselves. Usually he would pick the kid who thought of the trick in the first place. Lots of kids in Mr. Wendell's class had sent away at one time or another for a book or how to throw your voice. And the book came with a little device to hold your mouth that was supposed to make it easy to throw your voice. The kids who didn't actually swallow the little voice throwers had them taken away by Mr. Wendell. It was very hard to fool him. Other kids had read a book on mind power and tried to hypnotize Mr. Wendell by staring at him and repeating silently, Mr. Wendell, you are my slave. My will is stronger. However, Mr. Wendell's will was stronger. Mr. Like, <laughs> Inappropriate. <wrong> <laughs> And the kids who had tried to hypnotize him would wind up with a new seat near the front of the room and a note to their parents suggesting an eye examination. In the classroom, William clenched his teeth. And then you add the graham crackers to the heated chicken fat. Add paprika, salt, and pepper. It was a cooking program. All the kids giggled and looked around to see where the noise was coming from. William looked around too. Mr. Wendell didn't say anything at first. Garnish with banana slices in their skin. This festive dish will serve four. Mr. Wendell walked up and down the aisles, trying to locate the sound. As Mr. Wendell got closer, William unclenched his teeth little by little, so that the sound of the radio got softer. As Mr. Wendell got further away, he clenched his teeth gradually so that the sound got louder. He was trying to control the volume so that it seemed to remain constant to Mr. Wendell. Wherever he was, Mr. Wendell stopped. William put his tongue over his tooth. Melvin, give me the radio. Mr. Wendell said. He had picked on Melvin Schwartz, the wrong child. Nobody knew that he'd picked wrong except William and Melvin Schwartz. Mr. Wendell had never picked wrong before, and Melvin was delighted. Aw, oh, jeez, Mr. Wendell, it isn't fair. You always pick on me, Melvin said, and he was just warming up. I demand my constitutional rights. You got no reason to accuse me. I demand a trial of jury by my peers. You are peerless, Melvin. Mr. Wendell said, give me the radio. I protest, Melvin said, rising from his desk. You are persecuting me because of my past transgressions. Melvin was the one who had put glue on Mr. Wendell's chair. And I demand a lawyer. You will have the best defense money can buy, Mr. Wendell said. And after that, you can go to Devil's Island. Now give me the radio. I have no radio. This teacher's awfully intense. <laughs> Melvin said, trying to look shifty-eyed and guilty. The class was enjoying this. It was obvious to them that Melvin was having a lot of fun. Melvin, open your desk, Mr. Wendell ordered. I demand to see your search warrant, Melvin said. 
Oh, our principal, Mr. Feeney, will be glad to listen to your complaint about an illegal search, Mr. Wendell said. Now open your desk. The teacher looks haunting, by the way. Haunting. <laughs> You're a stormtrooper, Melvin said and opened his desk. It was empty, except for Melvin's history book. <clears throat> Did not tell you? Melvin made a sweeping gesture to the class, which burst into loud applause. Mel William clenched his teeth just a little, and the radio played silently. Or faintly. <laughs> it played silently. <laughs> Melvin, empty your pockets, Mr. Wendell said, and Melvin emptied his pockets and turned them inside out. There was no radio. He smiled broadly at Mr. Wendell. Melvin? I apologize for having suspected you. Mr. Wendell said. Well, I'll never trust anyone in authority ever again, Melvin said. <laughs> William, <laughs> William was clenching as hard as he could to get the volume high enough to be heard over the applause and laughter. Melvin was taking bows from his seat. All right, who has the radio? Mr. Wendell asked. A mistake. Mr. Wendell was stumped and he had shown it. Therefore, the celebration I got louder. <laughs> I will step outside of this room for one minute. When I come back, I demand everybody to be quiet, and I want the radio to have stopped playing. It's gonna go too far. Mr. It's Wendell said. <laughs> it was a miserable trick. It would sometimes work for old lady substitutes or teachers. The class would think they were crying in the hall and lay out out of sympathy. But this did not work for Mr. Wendell. When he came back, an announcer was loudly saying, In Chicago, a kangaroo is still loose in the streets. Mr. Wendell was beaten. He fell back on another old tactic. Fine. You are all suspended. You will leave school at once and not come back until tomorrow with a note from your parents. That seems extreme. <laughs> the idea of a day off from school as a punishment didn't fool anyone. The kids all said, ah, fooey, and it isn't fair, as they were expected to. But in their hearts, they were thinking the kid with the radio, whoever this hero was. I mean, they are until they're fucking tired. Yeah, <laughs> well, a group punishment was easy to explain at home. Every kid's parent would automatically assume that some other kid and not their little darling had caused the disturbance. <laughs> not my parents. No. <laughs> On the way home... I've never done anything, and yeah. my parents would be like, what did you do? <laughs> I would be beaten just because they're like, well, you were in the room because it happened. <laughs> you, you probably influenced that to happen. <laughs> On the way home with the other kids, William kept his tongue over his tooth and said nothing. Later, he planned to, claim, planned to claim credit for the great thing he'd done, but for now, he was going to enjoy his secret. It never occurred to William's mother to ask if William had been one of the kids who misbehaved and got the whole class sent home. She went to the market, leaving William alone with his tooth. He was getting curious about it. Had the dentist, in fact, put a little radio inside his tooth? Why would he do such a thing? <laughs> the dentist was a pretty nice guy. Maybe if William called him and asked him. William looked up the dentist in his mother's little leather telephone book. Dr. Horwitz. He dialed the number and Dr. Horwitz answered. This is William Peedwee, William said. Oh, wait. This is William Peedwee. <laughs> That's the child. William said. Can you tell me something about the tooth you filled for me yesterday? He has a very adult phone. Yeah, <laughs> he's disguised. <laughs> I'll tell you what I can, Dr. Horwitz said. What I'd like to know is, why is my tooth receiving radio programs? Ha! Huh, your tooth is receiving radio programs? No kidding! Dr. Horwitz sounded interested. Yes, it is, William said. Did you put a little radio in my tooth? <laughs> I may have, Dr. Horwitz said, but it wasn't on purpose. Look, sometimes we put a little metal in there to make another filling, and it can make an electric current. It is possible that a filling could have the properties of a radio receiver. Or an old-fashioned crystal set. This isn't a joke, is it, William? William told Dr. Horwitz that he was not joking. He gritted his teeth and Dr. Horwitz heard, Tonight at the Civic Wrestling Arena, the Human Ape versus Dr. Death. Be sure to see the great match. Was that the tooth? Dr. Horwitz asked. That was it. Well, well, I've heard of this happening once in a million fillings, but it's never happened to me. I tell you what, come right over, and we'll put a coating over that filling and get rid of those pesky radio programs for them. What? Get rid of them? Are you kidding? I love this tooth. <laughs> oh, you like it, do you? You just wanted some information. Well, that's all fine. Enjoy your tooth, William. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever get tired of it, come see me and we'll fix it up. I don't know if that's how it works. <laughs> William thanked Dr. Horowitz and said goodbye. He was happier than ever about his radio tooth. One in a million it was. William felt he was a special person to have such a special tooth. 
And now, the number one tune-in on the charts, I'll never forget your nose. William listened to the music as he fished around in his dresser drawer for something to use as an antenna. He found a coil of wire that had come out of an old doorbell he had taken apart. He unwound a few feet of wire and clamped the end between his teeth. And that's the local news in Trinidad, Colorado. He's going to destroy this. <laughs> William knew he wasn't anywhere near Colorado. He listened to the station, and sure enough, it was a radio station in Trinidad, Colorado. He let go of the wire, and the station switched back to a familiar local one. And tonight, be sure to tune in when Barry Garble talks to a man who has lived underwater for the past 15 years. William thought of another trick to play with his tooth radio. He had just heard the back door slam. His mother was home from the market. William went downstairs to see her. There was a radio in the kitchen. To turn it on, you had to push a button, and to turn it off, you pushed the same button again. William helped his mother put away the groceries, then he asked her for a cookie and a glass of milk. While his mother was get getting a cookie, William clenched his teeth. The president has a cold today and did not come to work, the tooth radio said. Oh. <laughs> oh there's another picture, and it looks like the radio is in front of a bunch of pepperonis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> William's mother reached up and pushed the button to turn off the kitchen radio, which turned it on. Are you tired, depressed, miserable, stupid? Clunky's pills made with real extract of chopped chicken livers will. She pushed the button again. William clenched his teeth. The president's physician said that the president should get plenty of rest, drink liquids, and stay out of war drafts. William's mother was getting annoyed. She pushed the button again hard. William unclenched his teeth and the kitchen radio came back on. Clunky's pills cure asthma, chills, fever, and... <laughs> she pushed the button so hard that the radio almost fell off the shelf. William clenched his teeth. Ah, yes, back in 1957, President Eisenhower had a cold. She pushed the button. She was getting red in the face. Do you have malaria, mange, baldness, pimples, thrips? William's mother pulled the plug. What is wrong with this thing? I'm going to have your mother or your father look at it when he gets home. William was almost choking on the cookie. <laughs> he was having a hard time not laughing. Before he left the room, he clenched his teeth for a couple of seconds. President Coolidge had a cold in. William's mother looked at the dangling plug. William had to run upstairs so that she wouldn't hear him laughing. When William's father came home, he spent a lot of time whispering in the kitchen with William's mother. And that wasn't usual, but William didn't pay any attention to it. At the supper table, he noticed that his parents were smiling. <laughs> Something's wrong with our child. At the supper table, he noticed his parents were smiling and winking at each other. And they were smiling. They seemed to be in a strangely good mood. <laughs> William, are you okay? <laughs> Something is wrong with the kitchen radio, William's mother said. William waited and listened to the radio station inside his head. A station break was coming and he clinched. This is WXXO radio. Ah, did somebody say radio? William's father asked. William clinched. Radio all day, all night. Have some carrots, William's mother said. William clenched his teeth as hard as he could. And now the news! Today a large cardboard carton of frozen potato pancakes was sighted floating in outer space. Do you want some more milk, William? His mother said. What is this? What, is, what was wrong with them? <laughs> Why couldn't his parents hear the radio? William was clenching his teeth so hard. The radio tooth was so loud it was giving him a headache. Say, you'll never guess who I met downtown today, William's father said. It was Dr. Horwitz, the dentist who takes care of William's teeth. Oh, he's an awfully nice man, William's mother said, and she started to giggle. Ah, yes he is, William's father said, a very nice man and so interesting. You know, he told me some fascinating things about dentistry. Ah, so that was it. Horwitz had finked. <laughs> William decided that he was going to bite Dr. Horwitz's finger off one of these days. Oh my god. And guess what it happened to come by while we were talking? William's father went on. Oh, who was it, dear? William's mother was laughing so hard she could barely talk. Why, it was Mr. Wendell, William's teacher, oh. <clears throat> his father said. And he had something also fascinating to tell the both of us. Why, it seems that someone in William's class today was playing a radio. <laughs> and Mr. Wendell just couldn't find it. Ah, oh, the poor man finally had to send the whole class home. Ah, oh, that certainly is fascinating, William's mother said, and she was laughing so hard that she had to hang on to the table to keep from falling out of the chair. Why is she, <laughs> she is hysterical. Uh, it's like, 
it's I funny. Can being annoyed <laughs> that her child caused such a ruckus. And what did Dr. Horowitz have to say about dentistry, dear? That was so fascinating. Well, it seems that Dr. Horowitz had just done a filling for one of his patients. And that filling turned out to work just like a radio. <laughs> oh, imagine that, William's mother laughed. Was the patient anyone we know? No, this whole family's deranged. <laughs> mm, let me think, his father said. I believe it was someone we know. Ah, who was it? Oh, that's right. We have a son, and his name is William. <laughs> William's father and mother were both helpless with laughter. I hated it when they laughed like this. <laughs> what the fuck? Is this family <laughs> He was good and mad. Why did Dr. Horowitz have to go blabbing things? Why did Mr. Wendell have to turn up and make things worse? Eh, someday he was going to get even with the both of those guys. <laughs> William's parents were finished laughing and were now at the wet-eyed and sighing stage. William got ready for the serious part. Hey, William, psychopath. <laughs> William... <clears throat> Mr. Wendell understands that there will be no more problems with radios in school, his father said, and Dr. Horwitz is of the opinion that your tooth will settle down in a day or two and stop receiving. But if it doesn't, he will see you on Saturday and put a nice coating of epoxy on it. Meanwhile, no more tricks and no listening to your tooth in bed. <laughs> now. How are you going to stop him? <laughs> See if you can get me the baseball scores on your molar, son. <laughs> At this point, William's father collapsed back into laughter again. William got up and walked straight out of the kitchen and into the backyard. He was disgusted. Adults never know a good thing when they see it. His tooth was one in a million and his parents were treating it like a joke. William stood in the backyard. He could hear his parents still laughing from inside the house. They didn't care that they just had ruined everything for their only son. Mm -hmm. William was angry and miserable. <laughs> everything here is just utterly over the top. Yeah, like, what the fuck? <laughs> it wasn't going to be very much fun having a one in a million tooth if it was going to be coated with epoxy. Well, it's not going to be one well, in a million tooth anymore. If I ever have a little boy and he's lucky enough to get a radio tooth, I'm going to do everything I can to help him enjoy it, William thought. William fished the piece of wire, the part taken apart of the doorbell, from his pocket. He played with the wire idly while standing in the backyard. It was a heavy, damp night. There was a storm brewing somewhere. Already, William could see a little glow in the sky now and then, lightning a long way off. He put one end of the wire in his mouth. In East Trinidad, there will be a meeting at Cowboys Mahjong Club behind the feed store at 7.30. It was that station in Trinidad, Colorado, and it was coming in very clear. Wouldn't it be kind of like... I would think so. <laughs> Seems like an immediate problem. <laughs> William remembered that he had tried to plan out a tried to plan out a longer piece of wire. He had some up in his room, but he didn't want to go back in the house. He didn't want to see his mother and father. He was mad at them. Then William had a bright idea. All around the backyard there is this metal chain link fence. Jesus. William could wrap one into the piece of wire <laughs> around a fence post, and then the whole thing would be one immense antenna. I bet I could hear China, he said loudly. Yeah, but you would be able to understand. William twisted one end of his wire around a fence post. The other end he put into his mouth. Mm -hmm. Then he had a very unusual experience. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> he felt a thumping, like the thumping of a bass drum. He heard a sort of rushing and buzzing noise. He saw amazing colors, purple, red, blue. And his body did things all by itself. All these things seemed to be going on for a long time, but William knew it was happening very fast. And while all these things was happening, William was remembering all that he knew about static electricity. He thought about when it was cold and dry and you rub your feet on the carpet, and when you touch a doorknob and there was a snap and you could see a little spark. Oh God, it's, he's dying. It seemed to William that the chain link fence had stored up a very big charge of static electricity, and William had just bitten right into it. He noticed now that he was lying in the grass oh and having gosh, a hard time breathing. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing was particularly hurting him, but he did have a very funny taste in his mouth. <laughs> there is a, a photo of William being electrocuted to death. He's just dead. <laughs> his parents go out and they just laugh hysterically. <laughs> <laughs> then William noticed that his tooth was not receiving at first. He thought the tooth had gone completely dead. Then he was able to hear some faint static. 
but there was no program. There was no WXXO. William clenched his teeth and the static got louder. William listened. He was lying in the grass where he had landed when he got the shock. The static was kind of rhythmical, like music. It was interesting. William thought it was almost like a language. The more William listened to the strange static, the more he felt he could almost understand it. It wasn't as though he could hear words coming through the cackling and whistling. It was the noise itself that had meaning. When William tried to listen hard, it was difficult to understand. But when he just relaxed and paid half attention, it was almost more possible to understand. William, we're going now. We'll be visiting across the street. Stop lying there in the grass, was William's father. What if he was dead? <laughs> <laughs> A few months ago, there had been some big arguments about babysitters. William had finally persuaded his parents that he was old enough to be left by himself as he's frying in the grass. Yeah. At least when they were not going anything further away than the house of a neighbor. You're gonna get a babysitter and walk around the street? Why wouldn't you just take your kid with you? I'll go inside soon, William said. I'm just looking at the sky. He was not exactly lying. He was looking at the sky while listening to the strange rhythmic stay static in his tooth. It looked as though it might not rain after all. The clouds were breaking up and a few stars were starting to show. The static was starting to make sense. It wasn't like anything William had ever heard. He knew what the noises meant. He could tell the directions they came from. The noises were spacemen talking to one another. Somehow, William's tooth had been converted to receive signals between the spacemen. Probably the charge of static electricity had done it. The static told William more than words ever did. He could tell there were a different number of spacemen talking. Some were far away in spaceships. Some were on Earth. William could tell where the spacemen were in relation to one another. He could tell how fast they were moving and in what direction. It was almost as if he could see them. It was like listening to a baseball game on the radio. He could see players in their various positions as new information came over the radio. William could move the players in his mind, play the game in his mind. This was better than a baseball game. The field was thousands of miles, millions of miles. The players were spaceships that moved with such speed they could go so fast and so far they would disappear in seconds and reappear in some other part of the sky. He's just dying. <laughs> they reminded William He's of those bugs. <laughs> He's just seeing like sparkles because he's fried. <laughs> they reminded William of those bugs that scoot on the surface of water in the summer. William was listening to 20 or 30 conversations all at once, and he seemed to have no trouble sorting them out. He could tell where each spaceman was and what he was talking about. Some of the conversations were about potato pancakes. Some spacemen were assembling huge piles of potato pancakes in remote places on Earth. Spaceships would come and collect the potato pancakes and speed away with them. I have to say potato pancakes one more time. Other, con Irish <laughs> Other conversations were about navigations and spaceships keeping in touch with one another. Some of the conversations were about a boy. An Earth boy who was listening in. The spaceman knew William was listening and it made him shiver. One of the spaceships was getting closer. As it got closer, the static from the spaceship got louder and clearer. It seemed to William that the spaceship was getting bigger and bigger. It was zooming towards him. William decided to get up and go inside the house. <laughs> <laughs> he discovered, though, that he couldn't move. He couldn't even twitch a finger. Yeah, because you're dead. He could see the spaceship, a spot of light a long way off. It was getting bigger and bigger, and he could see it clearly. It was saucer-shaped and glowing <laughs> and spinning. Like... <laughs> <laughs> <He's> like, <"Whoa!" laughs> <laughs> the static from the spaceship was so loud that William couldn't even hear his heartbeat, which was pounding. Now the spaceship was directly over him and falling. He was sure the thing was going to crush him. The static kept telling him not to be scared, but he was scared. Oh, very scared. <laughs> the saucer so stopped falling, right and it just hung above him. William could see that it was made of metal. It had a reddish color that changed to blue or green from time to time. It was spinning slowly and rocking slightly from side to side. Up till now, William had not thought of screaming for help, and he thought of it now. The picture is of the spaceship, which has not revealed in the story yet, but it is shaped like a hamburger. <laughs> I don't know why they put the picture there, not the next page. Mm -hmm. But the static was so loud that he could not tell if he was screaming out anything or not. He was still screaming, or trying to, when he started floating through the air. <laughs> <laughs> he was moving through the air slowly, as though something was drawing up towards the spaceship. And he was spinning he with the spaceship. Out the window, and your son's just, away. just getting abducted. And the dad's like, son, what are you doing? Son, stop, stop getting abducted. 
Must have taken about a minute or so for William to spin and float up to the saucer. When he'd almost reached it, a hole appeared in the metal skin of the thing. Don't call it skin. It wasn't like a door. It was a round hole that appeared in the metal. Very small. But it got larger as William got closer. And as he passed through it, the hole closed again under him. He knew this because he found himself lying on a solid metal floor the moment he had gone through. Gross. All around him were cardboard cartons. They were ordinary cartons, the kind that pile up behind the supermarket. They had advertising for cigarettes and toilet paper. They were all different sizes and shapes, and they were all full of potato pancakes. Fresh, frozen. What well, the you, hell is a potato pancake? Uh, I think it is literally, it's just like a hash brown. Yeah. William discovered he could move once more. He had a look at the room he was in, and it was glowing with a greenish light that seemed to come from everywhere. The walls and floor and ceiling were made of metal, and there was a little round thing on the ceiling made of shiny metal. It was about the size of a tennis ball and covered with little bumps. The room seemed to be sort of a storage closet. You have been captured by the space burger from the planet Spiegel. It was the little round thing talking. A sort of loudspeaker. It was making the sort of same sort of static that William had been receiving in his tooth. And he understood it perfectly. <coughs> no harm will come to you. You will be treated fairly and returned to your home. The speaker went on and William was good and scared, even though the little round metal thing had told him not to. I want to go home, William said. <laughs> that is <clears throat> not possible at this time, the speaker said, but we'll let you out of the storage closet. Uh, fine, let me out. First, you must promise that you will not attempt to harm the space burger and that you will abide by the regulations governing spacemen on board this craft. That's fine, William said. Also, you must promise not to tell anybody about the things you see or hear on the space burger. I don't negotiate with terrorists. I, I won't say a word. All right. <laughs> In a few seconds, a door will open and you may go up the ladder, the speaker said. William was a little scared at the thought of meeting the spacemen. He had seen a lot of science fiction movies. Maybe they were green and scaly like lizards. Maybe they had heads like flies with big, weird fly eyes. Maybe they were green weeds and talked in horrible whispers. But there's nothing to do but go out and find out. A door opened and it just appeared in the wall like the round hole that William had floated through when he'd been brought on board. And beyond that was a ladder. William climbed the ladder, and the ladder took him up to a metal corridor. It was glowing green like the storage hole, only brighter. And it was hot, and William could hear something buzzing. He had an idea that he was somewhere near the engine, or whatever made the space burger go. William walked along the corridor until he came to the end. There weren't any doors, just smooth metal walls glowing green. At the end of the corridor was another round, shiny metal speaker, like the one in the storage area. Is that you out there? The speaker said. Yeah, William said. <laughs> a door opened and William stepped into a room, and he could tell it was the control room of the Space Burger. It looked like every control room of any spaceship he had ever seen in any movies or on TV. <laughs> that description. <laughs> there were lots of TV screens and flashing lights and panels of buttons and dials. Just, you know, the work other people did. <laughs> there was also a deep fryer and a soft ice cream machine. <laughs> Imagine flying through space with a fucking fry daddy. <laughs> like in the control panels. <laughs> Zero fucking oil. That is hellish. <laughs> <laughs> the spacemen weren't at all what William had expected. They looked like ordinary Earth people, except that they were very fat. Yeah. William guessed that they had well, to weigh <laughs> they had to weigh at least three hundred and fifty pounds apiece. That's not even fat by American standards. Oh, my <laughs> <laughs> That's like average. <laughs> There were seven or eight of them. They didn't have the sort of uniforms that William had expected either. The spacemen wore plaid sport jackets. It really is. This would not pass today. I'll look up when it was published when we're done. Uh, <clears throat> they were wearing plaid sport jackets and Dacron slacks. They had knitted neckties and black and white shoes with thick rubber soles. Fatter than any human could be. <laughs> 300 pounds. <laughs> they all had crew cuts and they all wore eyeglasses made of heavy black plastic. They're fat nerds. <laughs> the only thing about their clothing was sort of nifty and space marine-like was their belts. The belts were wide and made out of white plastic. They had silver buckles in the shape of cheeseburgers with a bolt of lightning going through it. Some of the spacemen had tie clips with the same design. I am Hanam, the captain of the space burger, one of the spacemen said. We apologize for having to capture you, but we had a bad experience not long ago. It seems one of our space burgers picked up an Earth person, and even though he promised not to say anything about it, as soon as he was released, he went on the radio and blabbed about everything. We can't take the chance that you'll do the same thing, especially this close to the invasion. Look at these spacemen. They are adorable, and I love them. 
<laughs> they look oh, like little penguins. They, <laughs> they look like their names would be Robert or Norman. It is Hannum. <laughs> Invasion, William said. Are you going to invade Earth? Yes, of course we are. Yeah. Don't you ever go to the movies? Spacemen are always invading places. We have been collecting all the potato pancakes we can find, and we're shipping them back to our leader, Sargon, on the planet Spiegel. They are his favorite. Now that we have collected most of the potato pancakes, we're going to invade. But why do you want to invade Earth, William asked. For the pancakes. We never did anything to hurt you. Because we're pirates, Hanum said. Space pirates. Look. All we do is invade planets, take what we want, and then we go back to Spiegel and have big celebrations. After a while, we go out and invade some more planets and take some more stuff. It's really a lot of fun. Well, there aren't very many of you, William said. Oh, there are very many of us, all right. Hanum said, this is just a potato pancake and collecting ship. The main fleet will be arriving any time now, and then the fun begins. William was very worried about all the things Hanum was saying. He was afraid the spaceman would hurt his mother and father. He had seen movies in which spacemen came to Earth with death rays and things that shot fire and turned people to mush. Do you have death rays? William asked. Are you going to knock down all the tall buildings in Tokyo and Los Angeles? What? No, Hanum said. We don't do anything nasty like that. Look, all we do when we invade a planet is walk around, have some snacks, and we don't pay for them. And after a while, we use up all the things we came to get, and then we enslave the local population and get them to produce more things that we like. That's all. We don't do anything destructive. Hanum did seem very friendly. But William still didn't like the idea of Earth being invaded. So in other words, you just come here to steal things. William scolded. Plunder. Plunder is the word, me boy. It's a tradition. <sighs> Whatever. Are you going to let me go home? William asked. <laughs> After we start plundering, then we'll put you down near the place where we picked you up. Meanwhile, you just stay out of the way and enjoy the ride. Now I have to get back to work. You may look out the porthole if you would like. William was standing near a round window in the side of the space burger. He walked over and looked out. What he saw was amazing. He could see the entire planet, or most of it. The space burger had gotten very high since he'd been taken on board. He could see North America and part of South America and Europe. It was like the globe in Mr. Wendell's classroom, only the colors were much nicer. Everything was sort of shimmering and glowing and reflecting the light of the moon. There were clouds like strings of yarn near the earth, and the oceans and big lakes shimmered beautifully. William really liked this. It was very cool. And he really liked the earth. Cool, <laughs> he really liked the earth, just not the sight he was enjoying. He felt that earth was a wonderful place. It was his home and he liked it. It made him feel sort of strange and sad. It made him feel sadder to think that the people of earth were going to be invaded. And the people were going to be enslaved by these fat spacemen. <laughs> <laughs> William wondered what he could do about it, but he was just a kid. What was he going to do? Aww. His radio tooth was starting to work again. He had been too busy to pay attention to it, but he had been vaguely aware of the fact that he hadn't been receiving since he came on board the Space Burger. Now, standing near the glass or plastic window, was starting to pick up faint signals again. William thought that maybe the metal Space Burger stopped the radio waves, but they could pass through the stuff the porthole was made of. <laughs> The signals were not as loud and as clear as they'd been on Earth, but if William clenched his teeth hard, he could make them out. There was the static language of the spacemen communicating. Moving through space, William wasn't able to make a mental picture of the movements, but he did get the impression of a lot of activity. There seemed to be more and more of the space burgers every minute. William strained to try to see them, and every now and then, he did see a brief flash of reflected light that might have been another space burger. William could also hear the radio station on Earth that had always come through on his tooth, and it was very faint. He had to clench his teeth so hard to hear it that it gave him a headache. He could only keep it up for a few seconds at a time. The radio station was broadcasting news flashes, and they were very interesting. Flash! The millions of round objects falling slowly through space are not meteorites, as previously thought, but have now been identified as fat men wearing plaid sport jackets falling slowly into our atmosphere. Stay tuned to this station for further reports of this amazing phenomena. The invasion had started. William hoped his mother and father weren't too scared. Reports from our affiliated station seem to indicate that fat men have started to land. It is estimated that there are hundreds, no, millions of them still in the sky. The fat men are landing in all parts of the world. But the, <laughs> but the greatest concentrations appear to be in California and New Jersey. William looked around. All the fat men except for Hannah were buttoning their plaid suit jackets and putting their plastic black rimmed eyeglasses in their pockets, preparing to jump. Hannum was standing at the controls, operating the space burger. 
A door opened to the side of the space burger and the crew jumped out. William looked out the porthole and saw the fat men slowly tumbling their way towards Earth. <laughs> Jesus Christ. There is widespread panic all over Earth as the hordes of fat men from space continue to land. So far, there have been no reports of hostile acts. The governments of all the countries of Earth have asked people to remain calm and stay in their houses until the invaders express their intentions. We will keep you informed as this amazing story continues to develop. William could see lots of other space burgers now. He saw hundreds of fat spacemen tumble by his porthole. There were space burgers dropping spacemen as far as William could see. I don't know if we need to say space every time. The only clear places were over the oceans. Everywhere else, there were spacecraft and jumpers. It was really amazing. William couldn't remember ever seeing anything so amazing. What do these fat men from space want? Is this the beginning of a war? Do they want to conquer people of Earth? It appears that, for the moment, they want hamburgers. Crowds of fat men have surrounded roadside hamburger stands throughout the civilized world. They're also consuming great quantities of pizza. Cupcakes wrapped in cellophane and hot dogs, ice cream bars, jelly donuts, halva, chocolate-covered marshmallows. My god, it seems that the invaders from space are after every sort of junk food. Stand by for further bulletins. William was starting to get the picture now. He was beginning to understand what sort of pirates these were. The news bulletins were coming faster now. No cars, trains, or buses are able to move because of the gangs of fat men from space strolling the roads, eating Twinkies and Jumbo cheeseburgers. Airplanes all over the world are grounded by the fat men who are continuing to fall earthward. <laughs> it is next to impossible to make one's way through any of the great cities of Earth because of the clutter of popsicle sticks and empty paper cups in the streets. Conditions of panic exist in many parts of the United States. Residents of most areas cannot get to anything to eat but lean meat, fish, fruit, and vegetables. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <clears throat> A late-breaking bulletin from San Anselmo, California. Fat men from space broke into a warehouse and ate 60,000 frozen tacos. <laughs> On State Highway 22 in New Jersey, fat men from space held two 16-year-old girls captive for six hours at Burger World until the girls had finished deep-frying 148,000 orders of breaded clams. Breaded the... clams? <laughs> what the fuck? Bread these clams. That's disgusting. The Pentagon announced a few minutes ago that there was no more whipped cream left anywhere on Earth. General Fred Horsewhistle, speaking for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, expressed the opinion that it may be necessary to use nuclear weapons against the fat men, whatever the cost. Stand by for further bulletins. We must protect our junk. <laughs> the whipped cream is gone. William could see that the situation was very serious. The fat men from space were eating up all the junk food on Earth at a fantastical rate. What worried him was what Hanneman had told him about enslaving the people of Earth. <clears throat> to make more junk food for them after they'd eaten everything. He was alone in the space burger with Hanum, who was operating the controls and munching on a frozen pizza. <laughs> William wondered if he could overpower Hanum in some way and get to Earth to warn everybody about what was going to happen next. He decided, though, there was no way. He didn't know how to operate a space burger. And besides... Hannum was much bigger than he was. William just looked out of the porthole and listened to his tooth. In Cleveland, Ohio, spacemen are preparing to dynamite the locked doors of the White Palace frozen hamburger vault, containing one-fourth of the hamburgers on Earth. Mankind will never recover from this massive onslaught against its hamburger reserves. <laughs> the hours passed and news flashes continued. William had taken a nap and Hannum had let him make himself a milkshake and a frozen Mexican dinner. When William looked out the porthole, the fat men were still continuing to fall through the sky. In Coney Island, New York, hot dog men made a brave attempt to defend Nathan's famous hot dog stand against the large gang of fat spacemen. After a fierce battle, <laughs> after a fierce battle lasting several hours, the hot dog men were overpowered and tied up with strings of their own hot dogs, forced to watch while the fat men devoured all the steamed corn and French fried potatoes. This is, without a doubt, one of the most heartbreaking and tragic stories of the current emergency. And citizens of Brooklyn have already stated their intentions to erect a monument to the brave hot dog men. <coughs> it's only like five pages and my voice is starting to give out. A news flash. The White House has been invaded by the spacemen who have carried off the president's private store of frozen Milky Way bars. As soon as Congress can make its way through the welter of empty fish and chip boxes so many <coughs> that, are <coughs> that are obstructing traffic in the capital, it is expected that war will be declared against wherever these fat men are coming from. 
William thought this was starting to get serious. You know, you spacemen had better leave before war's declared. Oh, that doesn't worry us. Adam said, you don't have any weapons that we can't eat. <laughs> it looked extremely bad for Earth. William had just heard <clears throat> that the fat men had found the Holloway's Milk Duds factory in Chicago and cleaned it out. Giant chocolate factories in Hershey, Pennsylvania were deserted. Not a crumb or a person was left. Whole populations oh. were made. <laughs> Whole <laughs> I think, I think they're just leaving. Oh. <laughs> Whole populations were making their way out of city, stumbling on foot over piles of waste paper, cartons, and wrappers. Families tried to escape into the hills of the country, carrying a bag of marshmallows or a three musca musketeers bar. But in every case, squads of fat men intercepted the fugitives and took away their last bit of junk food. <clears throat> When William knew that the spacemen had gobbled all the cheeseburgers and pizzas and donuts, they would enslave the people of Earth and make them produce more things for the invaders to eat. It looked hopeless. It looked dismal. He looked at Hannum. Hannum was licking his fingers. He had just finished an ice cream pop and a bottle of birch beer. He was idly working the levers and buttons that controlled the space burger. An orange light was flashing on an instrument panel and a high-pitched beeper was beeping. It seemed to be a signal of some sort. Hanum shot a nervous look at William and went back to mining the controls. William looked out the porthole. There was a tremendous stirring in the space above Earth. It looked to William as though the fat men were falling upward. They were falling upward? They were tumbling up from Earth, just the way they'd tumbled down. William looked at Hanum. Hanum looked worried and preoccupied. What is this? What's happening? William asked. Hanum didn't answer. William tried to tune into the static language. And there was so much talking going on that William had a hard time making out what was being said. Something about a potato pancake? Yeah, the usual topic. While this activity and excitement, William clinched and tuned into the radio station. More reports are coming in every minute to the effect that the spacemen are appearing to leave Earth. This radio station will keep you informed. There was a thumping on the outside of the space burger. A door appeared in the first one, then another other crew tumbled in. They seemed excited. And there was another tough thumping, and more spacemen came aboard. What? What is this? What's going on? William demanded. We're leaving. As soon as the rest of the crew come aboard, we'll be off for another solar system. You see, a message just came from Sargon. There is a report of giant potato pancakes launched in space in the vicinity of the planet Zegler. We're going to go after it. It sounds like the b biggest potato pancake we've ever sighted. What about me? You said you are going to take me home. <laughs> there won't be time for that. A potato pancake like this. A wild one floating in space. Well, that turns up only once in every 50 years. You're just going to have to come along. But but when will you take me home, William asked. William? Well, we might come this way. I don't know. Six, seven hundred years from now? We'll, we'll drop you off around then. Six or seven hundred years, William said. I'll be an old man by then. I want to go home now. I just don't see how we can accommodate that. You don't always get what you want. <clears throat> Look, we have to leave as soon as the last two crew members come aboard. You promised to take me home. I don't want to go with you. I don't want to go chasing some wild potato pancake in outer space for 700 years. Send me home now. Well, <clears throat> the only thing I can suggest is that you float down. I don't know how to float down. Well, there's nothing to it if you have a space jacket, Anum said. Look, we'll give you a spare and drop you off. Hanum reached into the locker and pulled out a plaid sport jacket. Here, put this on. William tried the jacket on, and it was about 50 sizes too large. It came down to his feet. Okay, all you gotta do is jump, Hanum said, and the door opened. I'm not sure I understand, William stammered, but Hanum pushed him out the door. Goodbye. <laughs> Once he got used to it, William kind of liked falling through space. The only thing that bothered him was that he couldn't tell if he was falling fast or slow. As he tumbled down, droves of fat spacemen pushed by him, falling in the other direction, falling upward. It took William quite a while to fall through space, and while he was falling, he thought things over. If he understood it correctly, the plaid sport jacket was supposed to break his fall in some way. He, at least he hoped that was the way it worked, otherwise he was going to make a little hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. William looked at the map of North America below him. He wondered if he'd land anywhere near home. Gradually, the map turned into a model railroad landscape of mountains and trees and towns. He knew he was falling slowly, like a soft snowflake. And he felt like a snowflake. It was cold up here in the atmosphere. <laughs> William passed through clouds, slowly. The clouds were wet and unpleasant. Not all the way that William thought they would feel. He pulled the space jacket tight around him, and as William got closer to Earth, he could see the individual houses and cars. Now and then, a few spacemen would float up past him, a few waved. William guessed that most of them had already returned to their space burgers. 
William realized that his float down was almost over, and he felt a little sad. That had been the best part of this whole experience. William floated down and landed on the sidewalk in front of his house. He gave a little push to his feet and floated over the house into the backyard. He did one more experimental jump, went straight up about a hundred feet, and landed lightly. He took off the space jacket, folded it neatly, and went into the house. Here's a picture of William floating. <laughs> William's parents were glad to see him. They had been worried about him, of course, but during the emergency it had been impossible to get in touch with the police. William's father tried to go out and look for him, but he never got past an enormous pile of Big Mac boxes in the road. So William's mother and father just sat at home during most of the invasion of outer space, what? eating shredded wheat and lettuce that the spacemen had left behind and hoping their son was alright. Why are you, like, everyone's so suddenly hungry? Yeah. Like, two minutes? <laughs> William put the space jacket carefully away in his closet. He didn't have much time to enjoy it. School and most kinds of work had been suspended for several weeks, and the people of Earth devoted themselves to a massive effort to clean up litter. William and his parents were out every day with rakes and shovels and came home tired every night with their green salad and whole grain bread, milk, and sometimes lean meat. William and his parents got to enjoy the cleanup work and even the experience of living without cheeseburgers and pizzas. After the cleanup was finished, the government announced it would be at least a year before soda pop, taco chips, and a lot of other things were once again in general supply. Wow. There was almost no sugar anywhere on Earth, which turned out to be a lot less of a hardship than people expected. William's parents seemed to have forgotten about the radio tooth. William didn't see any point in mentioning it to them. It still worked, although not as well as it had before the shock from the metal fence and his old space burger adventure. Sometimes, though, the tooth would be silent for days. Sometimes it would play fairly well. When William went to the dentist a year later, the tooth hadn't played for almost a month, and Dr. Horowitz thought it would probably stop playing altogether after a while. He also told William that he, now, he had no new cavities, a common occurrence worldwide since no sugar was around. But the radio tooth was not entirely dead. Some nights it would play quite clear, and on special nights, ones that were especially clear and cold, William could hear behind the Barry Garble show a kind of rhythmic static. That was almost like a language. And that is the end. I read the whole book. My throat hurts so bad. Bye.